Good evening, YouTubers. I hope you're having a wonderful day. It's 8 o'clock on Tuesday. Start trying to start as sharp as possible. I just, frankly, I have a problem ever being late. So whether or not it's a meeting or a stream, it bothers me if I'm a few minutes late. So uh, pretty much we can be sure that whenever I can, it's going to be right on time. Let me just start everything before uh, we get going. Awesome. Oh, just let me just lower up the, the volume here. Okay, so obviously I posted a poll I, I have done for the last few months, and I really enjoyed doing that. But basically, to get your ideas on what you guys want to talk about, it definitely helps me out a great deal. And I'll, I'll show you what the poll showed. I mean, I don't know if this is exactly current right now. It was a, maybe a couple of hours ago. Audio is weird. Okay. Okay, L let me uh, fix that one second. Settings, I, I do apologize. I'm trying something new today here. So if, uh, is this better? So let me know if this is working a little better here. I think it should work. Sounds good to me on a laptop. But let me know if I have fixed it. There's a couple of settings. Okay, well, shoot out a little thing there. Let me know if it's working well, because I might have missed it up. But here we got the the uh, the poll from, uh, so I put up for the last 24 hours. Oh, even worse. Okay, I will shut it down for a second. My apologies here. Should not have tried something new, of course. And uh, here, and we are going to be. Okay, we're back to, uh, this should be a much, much better. Okay, so this should be back to the way it was the other couple of days. So it should work a little better. Let me know if this works or not, uh, one second, oh my god, of course, I messed it up. No, but should be good here. It's a bit robotic, echoey now. Okay, well, right now, this was the way it was in prior uh, recording, so it should be okay here. Anyway, let, let's try our best here. Okay, so anyway, we did the, the uh, we did the poll here. My God, I'm, I'm a, a little off here. Okay, Taylor versus uh, Twitter. That's obviously what we're going to talk about today. 60%. The Lindsley Lohan thing. I've kept bringing it up. You guys, 16%. I actually recorded a video. I'll drop it down tomorrow since you weren't interested. Charles Johnson loses free speech lawsuit. That's actually is an interesting case. Maybe we'll talk about it another time. And the Friday the 13th. A lot of people asked me about it. So I thought to see how interesting it was. Um, Oh, yeah, right. So too loud, too loud, too loud, too loud. My apology here. Okay. So, okay, so now this should be a lot, a lot better. My apologies. See? Okay. And uh, the poll. So, my God, it took us so long just to get to this point. Four minutes just to get so far as to say that... That... Uh, fix the audio. Seems like the gain is a bit high, but I fixed it. Tell me about the video. Is the video looking good? Because I can see that there's some dropped, uh, some dropped frames from some some obscure reason. We haven't seen that in many months, but you know, pretty much you can count on something going wrong with this live stream. At least that's been uh, the that's been the, the case for the last few uh, weeks. Let me take a look. By the way, say hi, come in. Let's see if we can actually av avoid uh, any any more problems and actually focus on what's going on here. Uh, everybody complaining about me. Hey, Tiva from Miami Beach. Happy summer. Uh, Mario Kitsune saw your chat with Tim Paul. Tim Pool, keep up the good work from the UK. That was so much fun. I mean, the conversation was about um, uh, an hour and a half. That's what uh, you saw uploaded. I spent me five hours with him, and it was just conversations nonstop. He never got boring. He's such an intelligent guy that... Even when we disagree, it's just a great conversation. You know, it doesn't we don't have to agree on everything, but it was just a great conversation. So I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, looking forward to doing it again sometime. My life with Julia. Hello, hey, how you doing? 
Michael Frudge, uh, listening from the swamps of Louisiana. Hey, how you doing? Let me see if I, I'm just skipping the comments about how bad everything else is, because I'm assuming things are getting a little better. My life with Julia, all better. Volume was too high. Camille Polowski, your convo with Team uh, Pool was excellent. Again, enjoyed it so much. It really was very, very good, and had to obviously keep a lot of facts in mind. Did mess up the the, the case when uh, I was talking about. I told, said it was a uh, by penthouse. You guys corrected me. It was actually um, hustler. The whole the whole uh, fair use argument was about hustler magazine. It wasn't about uh, penthouse. Shameless Jam, A OK now. Unlucky Eddie's greeting from the pit hells. I mean Utah. Should be beautiful nowadays. I'm assuming it's not as hot as down here in Florida. Should be gorgeous. Tiva sounds great. Everybody's saying now it sounds good. Video looks good. And the topic are interesting. The J vlog from Nagasaki. Gorgeous. Haven't been to Nagasaki. Spent I went to uh, school in uh, Tokyo to Joji Daikaku. Uh, Sophia University uh, did spend a semester there. Gorgeous, but never went to Nagasaki. Uh, Paolo, hello, you, you all. Drag everything looks good. Excellent. So, poof. I do apologize for the rocky start. I promise this is going to be actually a great conversation here. And the truth of the matter, I didn't know about uh, the this particular resolution until the morning of my conversation with Tim. He actually sent me an email. What do you think about this? We never actually got to talk about it, but he uh, pointed me to that uh, ruling because I didn't know it actually came through. And what makes it interesting, and we'll talk about it just to give some context to everybody, is it's not what everybody thinks it is. And if I can give you the conclusion, the grown-up conclusion, I'll tell you that it's both wrong. I mean, the judge made mistakes in his uh, decisions, just outright mistakes that are contradictory to just about every state in the country, just bad uh, judgment. And nonetheless, it's completely meaningless. It's The decision has no real bearing. It doesn't really focus on what people think it focused. And it was unnecessarily uh, decided the way it did, but it really doesn't mean much of anything here. But it makes for an interesting, because you want to go through the logic, understand what the judge actually said to be able to pick it up and see exactly what what's happening here, because... It does touch on a subject that many of you want to talk about for a very long time, and we spoke about it on many different streams and many different videos. The whole issue ultimately about whether or not a platform can ban you. Can they put restrictions on you? You know, Prager, you sued uh, YouTube over those kind of restrictions. Obviously, there were lots of suits against Twitter when it came to uh, kicking people off of uh, the platform. Usually, it's a free speech argument. A either public forum argument, variations on that. This is how this lawsuit started. It just didn't end that way. And that's what's uh, key here. The portion that's going forward has nothing to do with what most of you are interested in, which is the whole issue of free speech and public forum. But we'll get to that in a few minutes. As you remember, this is, of course, is a, it's a live stream. It's all about conversation between you and me. It's not about me you know, preaching for an hour. Uh, so please let me know your thoughts. Just make sure you'll see a little banner popping up every once in a while. But basically put an at YouTuber law in front of your comment that will put an orange box in front of it. And it will tell me that I need to read that. And I will read it out, whatever the comment is. I'll get, you know, whether or not it's just a comment or a question, I'll read, read it out. If you don't put it or if you try to put an at YouTuber law and it doesn't pop up as an orange box, YouTube messes up sometimes. Just do it again. Copy your message, do it again, at YouTuber Law, one, um, one word. You can see other people on the chat, what they're getting, a, a, an orange box. It's because of that. By the way, I forgot, Mario Kitsumi, thank you so much for that uh, super chat. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Mario Kitsumi, oh, does the states have a problem with activist judges like we do here in the UK? It could be an issue. I don't believe it's here, but let me tell you how, where, how it usually happens, in my opinion. And I can tell you that other people will, will disagree with me th saying that this is not really what's happening here, that there are actually activist judges who actually have their own agenda here. A lot of what we see here is not really activism. It's more about humans coming to the table with some preconceived notion. We saw that we had a discussion about that with 
the whole uh, judgment against uh, President Trump and uh, whether or not he's allowed to ban people off of Twitter. And, I, and we've gone through it. And my initial thought as, as well, I have to admit to it, that this has to be wrong. You should not be allowed to do that. But once you go through the logic of the case, what the judge actually wrote, you see that he probably started with the same conclusion. He probably felt it was wrong, but then he had to build the case around it. And that's why the logic just didn't fit. And that's why it should. And it actually, they announced that it's going to be uh, appealed, even though they released the ban, it's going to be appealed. So a lot of times I think it's judges that just because they're human beings and they come to to the table with some preconceived notions, have uh, a judgment in mind and then try to somehow make it work. And that usually does not work. So we actually see flaws in that logic uh, pretty easily. Addict, see, we don't actually see the orange box. It only appears to you. Oh, so you don't see it. Well, I do see it. Every time you put at YouTuber law, it uh, is. So if it, I will try to pay attention to any time somebody tries to, to put it. But uh, I do. Uh, I am sorry. Thank you, Addict C. Rod, having the right to sue means that Twitter has lost the right to ban Twitter, even before it's litigated. Well, not really. I mean, in the United States, the right to sue, I mean, there's two different things. The, the, the general, yes, we have the right to sue about every, everybody. That's true. But in this case, it's a very, very specific. So let's let's start it and rather than me just jumping ahead and giving and discussing it with you here let me start it and then i'll go back to uh that comment but thank you so much so what we have here is a man by the name of uh jared taylor and his in his foundation called the new century foundation now if you read articles about this case he is described now my description i don't know absolutely nothing about him i've never heard a word he said i never read a single uh, document he ever uh, written, largely because I told you I'm not really interested in the politics of this kind of stuff to begin with. It's just not not in my mobile basket. It's just not stuff, not things I care about. But articles describing as sometimes a white nationalist, sometimes a white supremacist. I think it's best if we would just see what he says. So we'll jump for a second to the complaint just to see how he actually uh, identified himself, and we'll go from that. And this is what's in front of us, which is. The complaint by Jared Taylor versus Twitter here, Superior Court of the State of California. So what you're seeing is obviously this is filed in state court, and it's ultimately because he was banned off of Twitter, right? He was tweeting different things. Over time, he got banned. He's suing, saying that they can't ban him. So let's go here, and here it is, section 13 here, and it says... New Century's purpose is to disseminate facts about race and race relations so that policies and public awareness can be founded as much as possible upon realistic assessments rather than intuition or ideology. Racial harmony, reduction of violence, elimination of prejudice, and mutual understanding between the races can be achieved only through better knowledge of all aspects, historical, cultural, biological, sociological, of the role race plays in the lives of Americans. It also seeks to study the effects that immigration is likely to have on the changing demographic, demographic character of the nation. And I'll leave it up to you to say what you think of that. Uh, obviously, he's talking about races, and he, he through his description, he obviously believes that society looks at the relation between races and immigration based on ideology and intuition, and he's going to bring to bear some sort of more scientific approach. At least that's what he says. I get a sense of what it is. Obviously, there's some key words there, but I don't really care who it is, and the court doesn't seem to care at all, right? And that's the way it should be. Bottom line is, are they allowed to ban him? What he says is completely irrelevant. Are they allowed to ban him? What he says is relevant, my apologies, if he does something like inciting people, right? I mean, something so provocative as to inciting people, or obviously defamation, or copyright infringement. But other than that, the content itself is uh, is not uh, permissible. He's obviously working on the idea that ultimately under the federal constitution, in this case, the state constitution, we must remain uh, content neutral. We're not allowed to actually discriminate based on the content. That's his idea behind it. Wow. 
Red risotto, wife and kids are at a concert, home alone and braised, and braised lamb shank. Wow, tasty. And best, uh, and YouTuber law, best Tuesday ever. Awesome, awesome. Love lamb. Unlucky Eddie. Flora would be nice right now because I'd be able to get good seafood without paying out of the nose for it. Unfortunately, I live in a, in a tourist town here in Miami Beach, so everything is expensive. If it's something literally fish that you can get by just throwing a line into the water costs nothing like yellowtails are going to charge you thirty forty dollars so unless you go uh, inland uh stuff is expensive here too jvlog youtuber snowcat is being sued for copyright for displaying a clip from a news feed the news clip was claimed by viral hog um send me a tweet about it I, i'm not aware of that i'll check it out see what's going on it's so easy nowadays to claim something, even if you have no rights to it under fair use. So it's become, it's really has become a problem. And people, unfortunately, as a result, are shying away from making critical uh, news because they are worried about being, being taken down, their video being taken down, and ultimately, what's the repercussion from too many takes down by YouTube? But send to me, I'll, I'll, I'd love to take a look. Kevin uh, Carson's sorry, just catching up. Is a judgment connectable to Trump not being allowed? To block dissidents? No, it's not. It's a completely different uh, case here. But let's just go for a second through the complaint, literally within with in less than two minutes, just to get the gist of what the guy is saying. What's the heart of the complaint here? And here we are back to the top. And it's is is suing under violation of California Constitution, violation of the UNRU Civil Rights Act, breach of contract, which is going to be the central issue in this entire thing, conversion, violation of Consumer Legal Remedies Act. Number four and five are completely irrelevant. And uh, let's just go through one, two, and three to see exactly what he's talking about. I apologize for scrolling a little too fast here. Don't want to waste time. Okay, so the first cause of action. He says, Twitter is a public forum that exists to give everyone the power to create and share ideas instantly without barrier. Obviously, the key here is a public forum. That's what he wants to highlight here. Because Twitter is a protected public forum under California law, Twitter may not selectively ban speaker from participating in its public forum based on disagreement with the speaker's viewpoint, just as the government may not selectively ban speech that expresses a viewpoint it disagrees with. I mean, that's at the heart of what this lawsuit would like it to be about. It's about free speech. Twitter is a public forum. This is free speech. As a public forum, you're not allowed to discriminate based on content. It must be content, uh, content uh, viewpoint neutral. As you will see in a second, the court says completely irrelevant. Section 230 federal law, Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act just basically means that this is complete and utter nonsense. It doesn't really spend two seconds on this issue and completely dismisses that, dismisses it out of hand. Section number two, they mean uh, claim number two here, second cause of action. Twitter hosts a business establishment under the UNRU Civil Rights Act, California Civil Code 51 at sequence. The act prohibits discrimination against person of unusual political views. Okay. Under the UNRU Act, therefore, Twitter cannot deny service to Mr. Taylor or American Renaissance on the basis of their political viewpoint. Once again, this is now a state law before it was a state constitution. Now it's a state law saying that you're not allowed to discriminate based on viewpoint. Once again, Section 230 of the CDA is going to prove to say this is complete. This is uh, controlled by federal law. As a result, you cannot uh, use the, the California Constitution or the UNRU Act to actually claim discrimination. The UNRU Act actually was the last bastion of hope for many, many people in California. They can actually force uh, platforms to not ban them, not discriminate based on uh, they, th what their views of discrimination is. They thought that this is a way of getting around the prohibition, the complete identification that Section 230 of the CDA provides. And for last maybe five years, there's been a number of lawsuits, and it's pretty much been determined that federal law here is supreme, and uh, you cannot use these state laws to go around federal law that actually indemnifies uh, and provide a complete cover for these platforms. So once again, 
any question of free speech, any question of uh, public forum, completely thrown out by the court. We'll go in a, in a second to the transcript and I'll show you what's going on. The court doesn't care at all about this uh, issue here. Which brings us to the third part of the complaint, which is breach of contract. Twitter terms of service and Twitter rules form a binding written contract between Twitter and Mr. Taylor and Twitter and American Renaissance governing the use of uh, Twitter. And this is the one thing that the court is going to focus on. It's going to focus on contract law. But more than that, it's going to focus on certain terms that's like, frankly, inside baseball. It's the kind of thing that first-year law students study in, uh, in their law school career. It's within the contract uh, classes. It's all about substantive and procedural unconscionability within a contract and when you can void a contract or a provision within a contract because of this concept of unconscionability, either it's procedurally or substantively. And that's where this case is going to go. It's not going to be about free speech or public forum at all. And we'll go through in a second and uh, discuss it. Angela Richter. It doesn't matter what Jared Taylor believes. The court should not care. I completely agree. And I think it's clear that the court doesn't care. It doesn't discuss. At least, let me put it this way. We don't have a court order in front of us. What we have is the transcript of what happened in court and what the judge ruled. At some point, they'll issue an actual physical order, but the judge already ruled. And that, at least from that uh, one um, proceeding, the judge never talks, never asks questions about content. And it's very clear to that the judge is of the opinion that at some times Twitter cannot discriminate based on viewpoint, based on certain uh, item. So they're actually going to get into an argument over it. Twitter and the judge are going to get into argument over it that we'll go through it and explain, but in my opinion, Twitter is completely correct on the law. The judge is actually mistaken. But nonetheless, this is not a case where the judge was concerned about the content. It's purely about uh, the procedure and realizing that Section 230, for all practical purposes, the federal law, is supreme over these state laws. Thank you so much, Angela, by the way. Mario Katsumi, I'm just wondering if you can do a video explaining the U.S. law system, say, compared to that of England and Wales. One, I would say Scotland, but also the Scottish law is confusing. And I've been working on it for a while. And if you see that book right here, which uh, I've read, and a number of other ones, basically, this is about freedom of, of, of thought. It's titled uh, A Biography of the First Amendment. It goes into a great deal about uh, how we inherited certain things from the British system. So I'm working on that and to explain how ultimately we have uh, progressed and why there's a division, why, let's say, our freedom of, of speech is, is quite different than what England has, even though it started from the same exact place. I've been reading a bunch of different books on the subject, so that's my plan. I'm looking to do it uh, for uh, next week and maybe a series of that, but... Thank you so much. It's actually something I was planning on doing uh, for quite a while. Just been reading up and learning a little more about it. Adrian Sanada, uh, did you hear about the UK citizen being arrested for having a potato peeler without a valid enough reason? I d I, I'm hoping that's a joke. Uh, if it is, it's pretty good. If it's not, it's pretty sad. No, I did not hear anything like that. Dev Youngston. Since Aquila admitted knowing it was criticism there by throwing fair use, can she be held liable under federal law for a false DMCA? In all likelihood, no. Because you may say, well, shouldn't it? If she knows it's fair use, then therefore she cannot file the DMCA. But the courts have so far have um, interpreted that concept of a false, DM the false DMCA so narrowly that, that this doesn't fit. Literally, the only way it can be be done if you can prove that it could never have been uh, your work. For instance, somebody filed a takedown when he did not actually own the rights to the property. That was a time when the court says, you know, false DMCA. But when there's question of fair use, then the the court would not uh, do that. And, and the court... Now, you would say, well, if she admits to it, it can never be um, 
it can never, if she admits to fair use, it can never be copyright infringement. Not exactly, because what she admitted to that he was criticism of her. She didn't admit to the conclusion of fair use. She admitted to criticism of her. She admitted that the title was critical. She admitted the content was critical. She admitted that he, that's what he does. He criticizes her. So if you take that into the formula where you're going to discover and figure out what, what is fair use and what is not, and that being the single most important, you would then reach a conclusion of it must be fair. There's fair use, and you really can't go much beyond it because the single most important. But it's not as if she said it is fair use. And so I would think, because the courts have been so hesitant to rule for a false DMCA, that this would not be enough. Be enough to actually for her to lose the lawsuit, but not enough for her to be liable for filing a false DMCA. Because she could still say it's critical, it's transformative, but not fair use because of the other elements. And although the other elements are far smaller in importance than what it is. And it may not sound may not sound, sound it may not sound very fair to you guys, but for some reason the law does not uh, is, is very weak on the concept of uh, false DMCA. And take this case aside as being irrelevant. It's it's something that the court should revisit, something that the legislation should revisit. There needs to be penalty for false DMCAs. There needs to be a process by which platforms are immunized, are not liable when they go after people that file false DMCA so that YouTube can then decide on their own and actually maybe shut down some people who are filing false DMCAs and trying to bring down a channel without any merit. But right now that doesn't exist. There's no such law. And as a result, it's often a free for all. Thank you so much. Where did I miss you here? Okay. Okay, Rod. So did the decision the courts made about Donald Trump not being able to block trolls influence this judge's decision to allow this guy to sue Twitter? I really don't uh, think so. Because very, very different. And what the other judge decided was, again, my opinion, completely false, that there is this virtual public space created underneath a tweet by virtue of basically any public official, not just the president, by sending out a tweet, he then takes over and creates a public forum within the, within and under a tweet, even though Twitter as a whole is not uh, a public forum. This judge also said Twitter basically is not a public forum. He actually did not say, he basically said that Section 230 overrules and, and uh, any sort of notion here. So no, basically just just the opposite. He did not uh, go along with the decision. It did not was not really impacted there. So very very different here. But thank you. Very good point actually. Red risotto at uh, yeah, it was great. Uh, people check out at YouTuber a lot. Team pool watch a what? Oh, worth a watch. It was. I mean, it's an hour and a half of going through. It start had obviously main cases like. Aquila versus Sargon, the uh, Cassandra versus, I forgot the last name, Robert, and uh, Maddox versus Dick Masterson. But in between, we talk about a lot of different cases. So there's probably in, in, in that hour and a half discussions of probably uh, half a dozen to eight uh, different cases and a lot of different issues and fair use because he's really pushing me on a lot of different things. And I really appreciate that kind of back and forth that I'd say, well, what about this? What about this? If we change this? So I thought it was a very good conversation. So check out uh, Tim Pool's uh, channel. He's very, very good. Control. Great seeing you on the Tim Pool channel on Sunday. Thank you so much. Random McRanderson. Mac yes, it was an assault potato peeler, though. You can peel infinite potato without changing the magazine. That's a good one. Mario Kitsune, the, the potato peel was most likely over three inches in length and any blade, bladed or item that can be used to cause damage over three inches is classed as a dangerous weapon out in public. I mean, are we really discussing this as a serious issue here? I mean, this is, I'm not sure anymore if you guys are all being satirical or this is a ridiculous issue in the UK about dangerous potato peelers. Uh, Corinne Tour. 
What's your take on the Majid Nawaj versus SPLC se uh, settlement? Did they settle because publicity or fear of losing? How the fact versus opinion in defamation cases work there? So if you saw my discussion with Tim Pool, he brought it up the first time, and it's not a case that I followed. So I didn't know anything about it. We brought it up generally so we can discuss this whole issue of a public figure. It's, it's a, from a, a con conversation that got pulled out of the Cassandra issue and how they kind of shot themselves in the foot by talking over and over how how big public figure she is, a great journalist, and I explain how it's that much more difficult, almost impossible to win these defamation lawsuits when you are a public figure. So that's how we got to this and we got into a discussion. But beside knowledge of it, not logic because of my conversation, it's in my reading of articles, I did not follow this case uh, enough to, to give you a really intelligent decision. I do apologize, but I just don't know it. Sandra, Adrian Sanada. It is unfortunately not a joke. The man is said to be in violation of a law for having a bladed weapon, the potato peeler, without a good reason. He is facing up to four years in prison. In prison, my God. Tiva Lesser, don't, don't forget to click like on YouTube or Law. Yes, guys, pl please uh, click uh, like because a lot of time people are not getting notification of the, of the live stream until after it's finished. When you like it, there's a greater likelihood at least theoretically, that YouTube will send up notification to uh, the subscribers. So thank you so much. Drifter, any thoughts or comments on the IG report or its hearing earlier today? Uh, no, I did not follow up. I was busy with uh, a lot of stuff, so I don't know much about it. Uh, send me it, uh, a tweet to, about it. I'll check it out, and maybe we can talk about it on Thursday. Mother, fo mother, mother, folks, mother, fox. YouTube having that sort of liability seems troublesome from a business standpoint. Even specialty trained individual, they could give any sort of law advice either. Paralegal. You're right, but as content creators are always complaining that their stuff is taken down, whether or not it's YouTube deciding or it's because there is a mob mentality that's flagging their. Uh, videos for improper uh, content or somebody's false DMCAing them. There's just nothing on the counter side of it. And probably best if they fix the whole issue and limit how they allow flagging to happen and how they, re they review content and the kind of information they provide content creators so that there is no, I'm doing great or I'm terminated the next day. But in that, in light of what's happening, given the enormity of the false flagging, the false DMCA, I would like to see there a counter uh, tool that allows YouTube or allows people, let's say that you receive a counter, uh, if you received a DMCA takedown, for you to be able to request an investigation of whoever filed it and claim that this was false and this is what was done and YouTube would actually pursue that investigation in parallel with your DMCA. I'd like to see a little more. That's not my idea. You're right. Maybe I'm asking what I'm asking is just going to be so problematic because if they can't figure out one side, how are they going to figure out the other side? But, you know, I think that the process has to be more even-handed and it's lacking right now. Fried, uh, friend, friend rear. Yes, yeah, someone actually got arrested and is being uh, tried for having a potato peeler. My God. To my own disbelief and horror, I can imagine. Mother Fox. Also, I believe there is a specific context in the law that happens to Mr. Potato. I believe you have to have a reasonable excuse to carry it in public. I'm going to peel taters. Yeah. That, I mean, again, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's because it's a law written to stop weapons and because it's not very specific, a potato peeler, because of the way it looks, might somehow get thrown into it. That's the problem with a lot of laws. And if you get into it, that's some of the problem with also First Amendment kind of restrictions that you have in England where you are allowed to imprison people and actually uh, find them because they might insult religious minorities or national uh, or nationalities of, of things of that nature. Even if the law was written with good intention, you can see how easily it can, a few years later, be manipulated and misapplied in a way that makes absolutely no sense. And this is basically, I'm, a, I'm looking at what you're saying. I'm, sounds to me like this is, again, a law that probably had some some intelligent reason for it, 
but now being applied in a completely ridiculous way. Adrian Sonata demands defense solicitor said in court her client suffers from significant learning difficulty, which has been lifelong. I don't know if that justifies uh, arresting him for carrying a peeler, but let's go through. So uh, what I've discussed now, let's continue now with the Jared Taylor before we continue. Please just put uh, all your comments and everything there. I will go through, I'll promise through every single one of them. So what we have here in front of us is not an order, but the reporter's transcript of the proceeding. Basically, the parties are in front of the judge. There's a court reporter. They're typing in each and every word. Sometimes they get something wrong. And then it's up to the judges to actually, I mean, not up to the judges, up to the parties to try to catch it later on when you see the transcript and ask. But we pretty much can assume that this is word for word uh, exactly what happened in court. So we go through the discussion. By the way, if I can suggest, if you want to actually read it is something worthwhile reading because it actually happens to be interesting. It's word for word, back and forth between Twitter and uh, the judge. Really not getting much from um, from Jared Taylor's attorney because they're kind of happy here. They're going through it. They realize from the beginning they need to be quiet. And actually the judge t tells them at one point, you know, you should learn that when you're winning to stay quiet. And, that's it. and he apologizes and backs off. And so it's really more of a conversation between the judge and um, and Twitter. But let's take a look here. And I'm gonna try to focus on only important stuff. I don't wanna go through and read the entire thing. I don't find that, that concept very, very interesting to myself, let alone I think to you guys. But it says here, and this is the judge talking, it says section 230C1 covers precisely the allegation in the first and second causes of action. I would now issue a tentative ruling to sustain without leave to amend those two causes of action. So right off in the beginning, no conversation, basically saying when it comes to issues of free speech, California Constitution or the Unruh Act, basically federal law is supreme in this case. Section 230 uh, of the Communication Decency Act pretty much negates it. They, the platform are completely immune. They can make content-based uh, discriminations here. We're not gonna talk too much, but basically completely immunizes it. The reason why this is a this is a very low level state court judge here, okay? So it sounds uh, fancy. It's uh, the superior court of the state of California. It's superior nothing. It's just a trial. It's just the trial level court, very low level, but it's taken its cue from the Supreme Court in California that already ruled on those issues not in this case, but in prior cases, saying that federal law is supreme in this matter. So it's not going through analysis, but it is taking those uh, decisions directly from the Supreme Court that already ruled on it. So it's not going anywhere. So any discussion of, of public forum, free speech, you cannot uh, ban me because uh, uh, you cannot ban the content. All that is completely thrown out in the first uh, few sentences of, of the proceeding. Again, this is just a transcript, right? It seems to me that the Communication Decency Act does not cover in any way, shape, or form the third cause of action, unfair competition law. That's when we discussed that, when we talked about it um, in the contract, that has to do with contract law. That's the third cause, uh, the third claim. When they say contract law, he's referring to the, here as unfair competition law. And it says, as to unlawful, the judge says, it's a unconscionable contract. California court makes unconscionable contract impermissible and violating uh, California law. So it's making a statement that the contract, that's the terms of service between Twitter and its users is unconscionable, which means they can throw out certain provisions or the entire contract altogether based on that. And it's gonna go through and analyze what it means by unconscionable. But that's what it's going to focus on. The entire thing is the unconscionability of the contract. And in addition, alleges that there was a misleading statement with regards to wide and free use of the Twitter platform for all type of speech. That is related. Again, it's all within the contract. First, it says it's un certain provision is unconscionable. We're going to go through and tell you what that provision is. It's really not going to say the entire contract, but rather uh, one sentence is unconscionable. 
and then it's going to say it's also misleading. And that's going to deal with why it can basically allow the, the lawsuit to not be dismissed. And what we're facing here is what in other cases we thought of, of as a motion to dismiss. In California, state action, we're not, we're not calling it a motion to dismiss, we're calling it a demur. It effectively is the same, it's a little different. In a motion to dismiss in federal court, the idea is whether or not the entire case will be thrown out, right? We basically assume that everything that the plaintiff is saying is correct, and then we say, is there a plausibility that he ha has a case here? If he doesn't, the whole thing gets thrown out. In a demur in a state court in California, it's not the case. We're looking about whether or not the complaint alone is uh, sufficient. This is not about whether or not the case would be thrown out, but whether or not the complaint sufficiently alleges uh, some claims here. And it's quite possible for you to throw out the complaint and uh, still retain the case, allow them to amend, or allow the complaint to go. So it's very similar, but not quite the same. And that's why it says, it seems to me that there is a sufficient allegation of a general reliance on that. One second here. Just want to avoid a lot of the back and forth conversation to get to some of the more juicy stuff, because there's a lot of arguments here. And this is Mr. Karom, which is Twitter's attorney. And he says, yeah, he asks, what are the unconscionable provision that your honor possibly sees here, right? The judge says we throw out the first two provision. We only dealing with the third, the contractual. We I found the contract to be unconscionable. Karom says the Twitter attorney says, well, what exactly is unconscionable about this? And the court says that Twitter can at any time for any reason or no reason pull any account. The judge says basically having a provision that says that I can at any moment change the terms of service or in any moment terminate you for any reason or no reason at all, that's unconscionable. And let me tell you, that's false. It's wrong. It's wrong in California. It's wrong in just about every state you can imagine. This issue has been litigated. It's part of what I would consider the old internet. It's been done 15 years ago, been completely, completely discredited years and years ago. This is a wrong decision. We'll go through and I'll try to explain why but it's 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 a false it's a false idea and the twitter attorney does a very good judge tr a very good job trying to get the judge to understand it but the judge is simply not listening to what he's saying okay let's go through some of the stuff here random mc uh, mcrandison the uk has a broken po pause law it really happened Poe's law says that it is impossible to distinguish satire versus extremist views. And in, in, uh, in this case, the, the UK are the extremists. It's interesting. I, I never heard of Poe's law. I have to look in there. Bob Bobby. I heard a child was arrested as they used a straw to stab a cartoon of juice too. I think it's getting dangerous there. I should tell my kids not to have any more juice boxes. Maria Kitsumi, I'm sending you the link to the news article to the potato peeler story. Thank you. I appreciate it. Random McRanderson, I keep a potato peeler under my pillow in case of a rogue spot. Awesome. Random McRanderson. Unloaded, though. I think you should be. You know, it's kind of dangerous in the hand of children. Alex ben Benke. I think that's how I pronounce it. If the space below a public official Twitter is considered a public forum, they can all ban... They can all ban pers Twitter personnel, have their accounts reinstated as they are being denied from a public forum. That, I mean, that's part of the mistake in the logic, right? I mean, that's why I think it's hard to understand it because ultimately, think about it. If the mayor in my city decides to throw out a tweet, he then takes what is otherwise a private forum, Twitter, and creates a virtual public forum underneath. By through one sentence, he basically took over the public. The city took over uh, a private uh, private property. That could not just happen, right? Nobody can come to your into your home and take over your apartment. Is if the state did it because let's say they want to run a a, a a highway through your property, you know they have to offer you to buy it from you. They have to go. It, 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 the worst, they're going to have to sue you for it, and uh, a judge will have to make a decision. So the logic doesn't work, 
And you're right, you can then start extending that. You know, if that if that makes sense, then you know, virtually every public space, I mean every space underneath every every uh potential public official becomes public forum. So can Twitter ever really remove people? Because they will have to see whether or not their particular tweet came from a discussion underneath a public forum and even and so literally they can never get rid of anybody. The logic doesn't work there. So I do appreciate what you're saying, but I think it's a it's not it's not what should happen. It's just a flaw in the judge's own decision, which leads us to what you're saying, which is a logical uh, extension of what happened there. Alex Benke, does this not violate the First Amendment as it forces the public official to associate with a person they may not want to? Uh, no, because the First Amendment does is not granted to the government. It's granted to individuals. So in so officials in their official capacity are not are not do not have rights of free speech as you and I understand it so they don't have the protection of free speech or the obligation of free speech when they are speaking as uh, in, as part of the government we as non government official have or non government have a right for protection from the government that's the first amendment but of course an official it gets complicated because we know that uh, Trump uses that Twitter account for both public and for private purposes, and that now it gets mixed up. And how do you determine? You know, that's not an easy decision. But uh, great question, Adrian Sonata. This incident with the president being unable to block people seems to be a setting major precedent. Do you believe this can lead to no one being allowed to block people? No. Absolutely not. I think this will be reversed. I think it was a wrong decision. I think it will be overturned. Uh, I think that if the appellant court does not overturn it, this will be appealed to the to the Supreme Court. And this is a serious, serious matter. I think that, um, like it or not, the current law of the land, which has been really undisputed and been won time and time again, is that Section 230, in this case, governs and, and platforms are allowed to to block you. They're allowed to discriminate against you. We're going to get into this argument right here in this case, actually, just like I'm saying here. The Twitter, the judge actually is going to put the Twitter uh, attorney on the spot and going to ask you are, you, are you allowed to discriminate because somebody is a woman? And they will say, yes, we will never do that, of course, but absolutely we are allowed to do that by law. So that's the law of the land. So banning people, unless they go back and change the law itself, change section 230 and they're already made some a few holes in it but unless they go back and change it which would be pretty monumental base the legal precedents are is not that's not a legal precedent that actually will will alter what happens on the platform max the fox thanks again for for the responses and yeah the uk being able to completely dismiss the very obvious context of any speech to deem it hate speech is well, I'll keep it professional. <laughs> Thank you. Don't worry about it. If you don't keep it professional, there's no way in hell that uh, the, today's stream is going to get monetized by YouTube, given the subject matter. So I people can say whatever they want to. Ozark. Uh, bait and switch, though, changes of the TOS is a real thing as well. Draw people in with good looking TOS and then change it to something that could harm them. I don't disagree with that. I really don't. But there's two principles here. One of them that we are, as adults, sign contracts every day and we have to be held responsible. Let me be clear. I don't read those terms of service. I have, I've read probably more terms of service than most people in their lifetimes because I, I wrote hundreds of them for different websites, different uh, mobile apps, just about anything you can think of. But when I do it for myself, when I sign up to stuff, I never read them. That's on me. I'm an adult who doesn't read the contract he signed, so I can not argue on it. And the concept that right now it is the law of the land, that you can change it, and as long as you're provided with notice, basically the notice that it's your obligation to check out uh, the terms of service, your obligation to know when changes are made. And many of these platforms are providing notification that changes are made. They don't just throw it in without it. It might be difficult for us to understand what it is, it might be difficult for us to find what was the changes. We can talk about the specifics of how to do it better, and that's the key. But the concept of you are, it's not a single contract. It's one that can change over time. 
is absolutely necessary. And again, this will be a discussion in this case and an argument between the judge and the attorney. So, but it is a problem, and I think it needs to be dealt with very, very differently. And the court has to look into, and this the court doesn't do, not about whether or not you are allowed to change the, the terms of service, but the process, the procedure, right? Did you provide notice? Do, do people know exactly what was changed? Did you give them uh, the ability to review it before it went into effect? Does not mean that you can continue based on the old one. You can reject the changes and still continue to be on. If Twitter changes, it's coming to change. Give them, I don't know, 10 days, 14 days to review it. They don't want to get off the service. So, but the idea that that they are somehow prohibited from changing over time will never work on the internet because laws change over time, standards change over time. A lot of this is also driven by industry standards because a lot of, in our legal system, a lot of these laws, the government often tells the industry to set best standards and they then regulate and those companies have to change all uh, based on those industry standards. So they need the flexibility of making changes, but it's about notice and giving people sufficient amount of notice and sufficient information to make uh, decent decisions and maybe not have everything written in such complicated legalese that they don't understand what they are reading. But it's going to be a big part of this uh, transcript. We'll go in, into it for a second. I think... Yeah, Randon McRanderson. Have you heard about the video games, in, including Spyro called Red Shell, that tracked advertising outside of the game? Uh, I read... I don't know if we're talking about the same one, but I've read those kind of uh, issues in, in, in the past. They, I believe those should be prosecuted because when you're buying one device and the sneaking in of something that actually can, can um, put a program on your computer should be considered a violation of federal law, which is um, um, dealing with the the trespass on chattel, the trespass onto a protected computer system, which is a federal uh, law. I believe that we need to extend that so that there's a prohibition that you are not allowed to place anything on anybody's computer without adequate notice, not just something buried in terms of service, not, not something that can ever work continuously, but unless uh, there's sufficient notice, what you, are, what you can potentially put is only something that enables the service that you're providing at that moment. Anything beyond that will be a violation of the law. I think that these problems have gone unchecked for too long because the law just doesn't know how to, to deal with it. Thank you. Robert Morrison, if the contract law part of this is not going to fly, could they have a case in antitrust similar to the Gap versus Google? Uh, no, I don't think antitrust would come into this, uh, into this case here. This is not a question I don't believe it's a competition. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a. I don't believe there's a there's a real competition issue. With Twitter trying to keep out competitors, controlling the market here. I think this court thinks so, and we'll go through it. it actually, says it. Twitter is the biggest communication network in the entire world. He ascribes powers to Twitter that I don't, I don't think are there. And but I don't think this is the kind of case that they would take on, under under antitrust, at least not in the current format. They're more like the government's more likely to take something like that on when, you know, if Facebook bought out Twitter. I think that may bring on antitrust issues. One huge competitor buying another massive competitor. But I don't think through uh, banning is the subject matter here because ultimately I do believe it is absolutely permitted under federal law here. Let's go back to the transcript here for a second. So it basically it says that it's unconscionable here that Twitter can at any time for any reason or no reason pull any account. I think it means terminate the account. Mr. Carone, which is the attorney for uh, Twitter, it is absolutely permissible. So this, this is him actually arguing with the judge and indeed subject to First Amendment rights an editorial decision that a platform that engage in the distribution of speech may for any reason, just like a newspaper e editor, could, for any reason, choose not to run a letter to the editor that it received. That's not unconscionable. That's not remotely unconscionable. I mean, he's really pushing it with the judge here. 
So the court says, so let me explain to you why I see it differently. And he goes through it here, but the interesting part is here. Twitter is the largest communication source in the world. And the way to get your word out and the way to be heard in the modern era is to be able to be on Twitter platform. Now, that's overstating it. Please. It's, whether or not it's the largest communication network in the world, I think it's an over-exaggeration because they're because they are, if you think about the telephone system, that's the largest communication system in the world, maybe owned by multiple companies and not by a singular entity, but that would be the largest communication network in the world. The idea that somehow Twitter is so big that that's the way to get out, that's also false because you have, a, you have at least a few other platforms that are larger than Twitter from which you can speak to, obviously through Google, through uh, Facebook, through uh, Instagram, through uh, YouTube, some very, very large uh, platform. So to put so much, you know, this is different because Twitter is so big. I don't know. I think that's stretching it a lot of it. And for Twitter to know that and nonetheless impose language as it did here, an otherwise prolific document that's not highlighted and does not and done on an adhesion contract basis on, on a take it or leave it basis, it is procedurally unconscionable in a large measure. So let's just go through for a second and just break down what they're saying here. First of all, the Twitter knew. Twitter knew they're saying that it is the largest communication network and nonetheless imposed language as it did, and it will jump here, basically says on an adhesion contract basis. The adhesion contract is the idea, and that's pretty much every single contract on the internet is an adhesion contract, right? Means that we can't negotiate it. Amazon puts terms of service in front of us. We sign it and we buy. We don't sign it. We don't get to use Amazon. That's that's a contract of adhesion. Now, in the beginning days of the internet, that was a big deal, right? Because that was the first time we saw a massive amount of... of uh, usage of adhesion based contracts where people were not negotiating before that it was a kind of one-off it was an exception and the court looked at it differently when it was an adhesion contract saying well when the other side can't uh, can't really negotiate any provision it's just thrown at them they should they should have certain more rights like unconscionabilities they should not be forced to do that but over time those kind of contract those kind of cases died out in the beginning those contracts of adhesion were important Go back even 10 years ago, that argument was valid. It is not. The entire internet, every single website you know, every mobile app that you know of is an adhesion-based contract. The concept that this is somehow different and deserving of a different standard does not fly anymore. It just It's completely false. It is old law, something that we haven't seen really, in my opinion, at least seven years. I haven't seen anything, that kind of an argument. And it says, well, this is another part that's really, really old. It says, otherwise prolif pro prolix document that's not highlighted. Well, what are they talking here? Well, the concept was, and that part, I agree that it's problematic, but not whether or not it actually has any legal bearing. The idea is, and it's true in a contract, when you've got a contract, let's say you, got, you go lease a car. And if everything is in, you know, 11 point uh, fonts and single spaced, no paragraph, line by line, no highlights, no breaking it down into different paragraph. It's almost impossible to discern what it is. And that's what they're comparing it. That this idea that the, um, that Twitter can change their terms at any time without, no with notice, but at any time for any reason, and it can ban you for any time, any, for any purpose or for no purpose at all, that should have been highlighted or in a way that people can notice. And personally, as a professional, I don't disagree. I can tell you that those provision in every single terms of service I've written is always in uh, all caps, often depending on the agreement, how important it is, and definitely in something like a social network, I not only put, include it in the terms, but then also include it in the beginning part where I put some notation. So people, if they just open it, will see it right away. And sometimes it's such a concern that I will take it out and also put it into the sign up process. So 
when you even if you never actually click on the terms of service and never see it you know in the i uh, i read and acknowledge the terms of service i'll actually put a point a little bullet above it that you can be changing any time so and there are lots of provisions not just that one provision so i'll try to maybe three to sometimes five provision that should be highlighted but so i agree because it's so important that there should be things that are critical to the entire concept like we can change things at any time we could terminate for any reason that should be highlighted i don't see that as being important to the legal case twitter contract uh, terms of service are not a huge mess of uh, single spaced uh, documents whether and the the idea that it can be changed in any time is not unique it is in every single website i'm just telling you every single website and i've written hundreds of them and every single uh, terms of service i can change the terms of service at any time by giving you notice i can also ban you terminate you suspend you for any reason or no reason at all and i do that not because we want to discriminate we do that because Sometimes we need to change uh, the business and the we want to let go of certain users because they don't fit the new business model. Sometimes we have to let go of consumers when we want to focus on businesses. Sometimes we do want to change the character or the age that we allow. There's a lot of reasons. So website with great meaning, you know, genuine, um, genuinely good uh, forethought need that power so they can actually control their business. So... This idea that this is somehow unique, a contract of adhesion, and somehow not highlighted that this provision, it's, I'm not sure if this judge has ever looked at this kind of a case before, because if you looked at a bunch of internet-related cases, technology-related, mobile app-related, this just will make absolutely no sense, because this is just something that was done seven, eight, ten years ago. It's no longer the case nowadays. Nemesis Blade, what if they create a special social media forum rule and how might that work? Are you talking about, I mean, Twitter has rules there, but, the, but just like YouTube and Facebook, you, they're so general that you don't know how your specific action fits. It's always the case, you know, YouTube can, can, uh, take down your video, tell you you violate some community guidelines and you'll never know why you did it. So they tell you they have rules, but not. you have to get better at it. Do you want the government to set up those kind of rules? I mean, that's going to be so, oh my God. I, I think that would be the biggest mess in the world. The government politicians in Washington trying to figure out how, how social media should, should be governed, how your actions should be governed, what rights you should have, how they should go. I think that's a complete and utter mess. The government could come in and say, look, you're obligated to provide rules and you're obligated to provide no notice. They can do that. And I think that would go well. But once you get them into the meat of that, I mean, you're asking these people to figure out how social media works. Have you seen the age of some of these uh, senators that were grilling Facebook and YouTube and Google? I mean, most of them did not even know how the Internet worked. They got some notes from their aides. So I don't think it'd be a good idea to give them any power to make those kind of decisions beyond some general stuff that they can enforce which i do believe is right which is about proper notification you know that people need to know everything they not not only one time but need to know throughout how what information is provided how they're being used uh if you are going to ban them what is the reasons for them give them some opportunity to argue it give them some procedure through which they they, they can actually appeal decisions I think the government can have a hand in that kind of a generalized decision, but not in setting up rules. Thank you. Good question. Good opinion. I mean, um, Mother Fox, I think explaining how the concept of free speech is not the same as the written law of the one and the law is protecting the concept from the government, not private business. I think explaining how the concept of free speech is not the same as the written law. In protecting the concept of government for not I don't know how to respond to that I think with all the dashes there I'm, I may lose what you're trying to say here because I'm, I'm I'm finding hard to, de to decipher that sorry George Wyckoff so a public official can prevent people from responding to him just by going into a private space do we need a law that state public official must must go through public uh, means 
that's part of the problem here. Obviously, you, we cannot tell them because they're also private citizens. And but I know the companies can obviously all, and are often telling you don't speak on uh, on social media in our name. You know, you do it in in your own uh, name. So maybe it's something government should say, at least to people that they can control, that that they should not be speaking through social media. But again, that does not resolve the, the whole problem here. I think it was a wrong decision here. I think that ultimately, if he wants to, I mean, unless somebody can show me the a, a legal argument, and the judge wasn't, and I, I haven't been able to figure out one on my own, but that, uh, and that thing, the judgment is just wrong. I don't see how you can prevent uh, the president or any other official from blocking individual. I, I don't think they should do it, but I don't think it's necessarily illegal here. Mario Kitsune with the Trump thing wasn't that his personal Twitter account is, I believe there is an official White House one. I don't know if there's a White House one, but this is the one that he had personally before he was ever president and he continued and he put on it that uh, changed his title to President of the United States. And he's using it also for official. He actually makes announcement. He uh, engages in discussing topics. It's not just a personal one. It's literally from what the court says anyway. I don't have personal knowledge because I don't follow him, so I don't really know. From what the court says, it's definitely a mix of both uh, private and public usage. There's a lot of public usage according to the court in it. Drifter. The Inspector General general report worth a skim is a bit massive for a complete read. Sorry, I don't use Twitter. Link altered to get around YouTube. Justit.com filed. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll take I'll take a look at it. Thank you. Contro. What would happen if Twitter and Facebook start to uh, to show political bias toward one party or the other? I mean, I think that if you posted that as a comment to uh, the video, I think you will get. A lot of comments back saying they've already been doing it for years. I don't, I don't know. I don't really see it. Uh, it doesn't bother me one way or another. But uh, because ultimately they have the right to do it, that's the law. You don't have to like how companies use the law. So let's say that Twitter today is completely unbiased, and tomorrow decides, you know what? We are going to support one side of the aisle or the other, the right or the left. Doesn't make a difference which one you are. Assume it's the opposite one. I think it's a bad application for a platform, and it's too bad that we don't have, you know, more competing platforms. But we do. I don't have to use Twitter. I can use Facebook. I can use other things as well. But it's also perfectly legal. Discrimination, bias, by these private platforms, right now, given the state of the law, is absolutely permitted. So them changing their bias and tilt will not change how the law sees it. Is the TOS a legal document? Absolutely. It's a contract. No, no different than if you went to lease your car and you signed your uh, name to it. When you click, when somebody poses you with maybe a checkbox, you put a check, I read and acknowledge these terms of service in the privacy policy, you click accept, you just sign a contract, you're bound by it, like any other contract. If there's something you don't like in it, it's too bad. And that's part of the issue here, that we do it all the time without reading, because in real life, we would never have signed so many contracts, but just because the way technology works, suddenly we are, you know. We started doing that, <coughs> sorry, before there was an internet with the video games, right? Or just software, you would get, uh, that was your original EULA, that basically was a wrap, shrink wrap around your CDs, and the minute you unwrapped it, effectively you signed the contract, you bro broke uh, the seal on it. That was part of it. You uh, At that point, you agreed to a license. Also, once you loaded it, they presented you with, with their EULA and you signed it again. So the concept existed sometime before there was an internet, but nonetheless, it's definitely something on a day-to-day basis we don't do. We didn't do until the internet. Now we do it so many times every single day and we never read them. The question is, should the law be there to protect us because we don't want to read it? Or should law should say, just like before, when you sign a contract, you're bound by it, you know. You have to be a grown-up about it. Adrian Sanada, thank you for providing this excellent content as of late. It's very difficult to find someone 
without a glaring bias. You are welcome. Change from the usual left versus right bickering. Thank you so much. But let me be honest, it's because I don't care about politics anymore. Not that I didn't use to care. I used to care a great deal. It's been a few years now. I don't care whatsoever. I don't follow them. I don't read them. Uh, I'm going to be changing to the unaffiliate political party just completely. I'm just uninterested in any of that. So, And I don't think I'm going to provide you also, beside my own personal bias against politics to begin with, I don't think that uh, I would do any justice here if I mix politics into this, because ultimately, if there's any value or just entertainment in the channel, is that I'm trying to explain things from a legal perspective. And arguably, the law is supposed to be not based on uh, political bias. I know sometimes it, it seems that it's not, that it, it is, but it's not supposed to be that way. But thank you. Obsessed enemy freaks. There is a bill going through Congress that could possibly engender the lives of children by banning the importation of child sex dolls. What do you think of banning these analogs? Banning child sex dolls. I never heard of that. I. That's interesting. If I don't remember, if you can send me a tweet, anything you guys tweet, I will uh, take a look at. So if you can send me a tweet, take, may take a look at it. I, I absolutely will. I'll copy this if I can remember. I'll look it up. But I just, I never heard of that. So... Uh, and why do you want to hurt people that want to use sex dolls? I'm not sure how that does anything, but okay, well, I'll take I'll take a look. Well, Zarek, what if they change the terms of service in a manner that would all of a sudden state all previous data we have will become publicized or such? It feels like there are limitations to TOS changes. Okay, so that would have to be in the privacy policy, and we have more regulations. See, we have two things working here. Right. On the one hand, we have common law dealing in uh, contracts and how contracts are. But then we, we each live in a state, right? I mean, obviously, if you're outside of the United States, you, you live under the, the states, the law of your country. And there are lots of laws about contracts and how they're changed and how notifications should be provided. And that needs to be dealt with through state laws. And it's not really dealt with in federal law. It's all state. It's all lo local here. For instance, California has been pretty much on the forefront when it comes to privacy laws. And wherever they go, the entire nation goes. Not necessarily because, you know, Florida doesn't have those kind of laws the way California is. But basically, any website, any mobile app needs to comply with every single state. As a result, it complies with the most most uh, prohibitive state, the more most uh, restrictive state. So whatever state has the most restrictions tend to lead the pact here in this California case was California. And so it does require notification. So the idea of making changes is not enough. Notice is a it's a great deal of importance and getting people's acquiescence. And I can tell you that if they made those kind of changes in the privacy policy, basically taking your data and just changing it, there'll be massive liability and lawsuits because there's a lot of, uh, there are laws when it comes to privacy issues. There's also rulings by the Federal Trade Commissions and a lot of different areas dealing in privacy and so you cannot change there are there's also a lack of information when it comes a lack of laws too as much as we have when it comes to changes is also lack when it comes to privacy because we don't have the kind of rules that uh europe has been adopting as of late which recognizes that it's our data google may be collecting it but it's our data and we have rights and those rights need to continue well past the point the first point of engagement and if Google collected at this point and gets our permission, does not mean they can do anything with it. They need to be able to, to, to get uh, further permission depending on how their usage of it. We don't have those kind of laws. doesn't give us laws that we are allowed to, with, to take the information back and prevent it from being shared and give acquiescence every time they want to resell it. That's needed. But you're not going to get there by limiting terms of service changes. You're doing it by actually having laws that are either statewide being pay, passed in your local uh, state or local country, or you can, we, you can go through federal, but uh, that's a little more complicated sometimes. More likely in the federal level will be more about the FTC adopting additional regulations, their interpretation of, of unfair competition and false advertisement. That's usually how they would adopt those kind of uh, rules. So I think that notification is the key here. And... 
but it's not restrictions on changes. It's really more of notification acquiescence. And if you don't agree, your ability to then take the information out, say, okay, I, I don't want to, you want to change how you use my information? Okay, I disagree. I now want to take that information out so you are not able to use it. That's what's needed here. And we just don't have that, those kind of laws. Random McRanderson. Thing is with Red Shell is a new one and it was in full price high-end video games for $50, $60. Some clause hidden in terms of sake or terms of service to make it kosher. Um, I believe that absent full disclosure and that disclosure would have to be because the fact that a website can make changes at any time to terms of service is nothing new. You've had that since the birth of the internet. The fact that they can terminate you for any reason you've had, at least since the what led to the passing of Section 230. Before that, there were some issues with it. With the passing of Section 230, it's it took about the 1996 uh, Communication Decency Act. You're looking, and definitely into early 2001, since then you've had the same kind of standard. It's not new. The idea that you can hide Trojans within uh, software is not common and never will be common. Hiding it without getting proper notice can never pass. So do we have the laws in place to actually deal with it? You can argue that we don't have it. I think that if they wanted to, they could probably stretch out the whole concept of invasion of a dual protected system that without proper notification, when they are loading on a piece of software into your computer through a game without having given you proper notification, they actually are, are basically in, breaking into your computer. That's how they would do it. But they, they need to make amends. Again, it's not going to be through the terms of service issue. And it's going to be by them actually changing laws to really realize that there's problems out there. Lighter gas. A little bit off topic, no problem. But are companies like Blizzard allowed to to score to scour the player's social media profile and ban and ban their game profile based on their personal opinions shared? Right. So we did a few of those videos back when uh, Jeremy from Unsleeved Media was getting banned and his account uh, was uh, blocked. And then we talked about a lot about about things like that happening on Steam. And I uh, believe we had a conversation on Blizzard as well. Are they allowed legally? Absolutely, yes. They can say, you know what, you're playing video game. I want to go to Twitter, see what you, and then ban you from playing our game based on that. So legally, they are allowed. Why? Because they're allowed to ban you for any reason. So if they're allowed to ban you for any reason, they're definitely allowed to ban you for your opinion on other platforms. They do not have to adhere to any sort of First Amendment regulations. They're not the government. First Amendment only applies to the government. Is it a good business? And when they no, and when they do it, the problem is sometimes when they do that, they confiscate your digital assets. That's when they break the law. Often, often they try to, they do their best to try to change the terms of service, their licensing agreements to allow them. They often make mistakes. We've gone through and explained sometime how, in, in case of Magic: The Gathering, how they, there was a, they did not set up their digital currencies properly, and as a result, they're not able to really confiscate your digital assets but that's usually the parties it's not about banning you they can do that it's about either in dis disabling your ability to play the game that you already paid for or confiscating digital assets that's where the pro the legal issues could arise thank you malcolm bell one question concern i have over twitter banning people for various reasons could they actually be sued for damages for banning someone under false pretenses and causing damages no because they don't have to they, since they can ban you for anything even a false pretense is permitted there is just under the current law they can ban you for any reason whatsoever and there's no exception to that here the law has not evolved to consider Twitter to be a public forum. It's not public accommodations where there's some changes of law. Right now, the way it is under Section 230, completely banned. So if I can ban you for any reason, I can ban you for false reasons, for terrible reasons, for discriminatory reasons. It doesn't make a difference at all. Let's just go back to the transcript here and go back through it. So they're saying that 
that sentence that allowing you to make changes is procedurally unconscionable here. And I let's see if I can actually. No, it doesn't show me here. I was I had a note here, but we're looking at procedural unconscionability, and later on we're talking about uh, substantive unconscionability. And what does that mean? It means that according to the court, when Twitter forced on you the contract of adhesion, that's procedurally uncon unconscionable. Not enabling you to make some nego to negotiate, not being able, not, not highlighting the paragraph. That created a process that is unconscionable. As a result, they can uh, discount that provision. It's also substantively unconscionable saying that actually saying that you can ban people for any and all reason for that in itself is something impermissible. And it's substantively unconscionable to deprive people of the most important platform, sorry, to speak and to be able to seek redress of their legislator. Again, they're saying basically that Twitter is so different and so unique that actually banning them, banning them from, from Twitter is substantively unconscionable. That goes into, so question, hold on a second. So at that point, the Twitter a lawyer is completely confused. Hold on a second. You're basically saying that I can't make changes in the contract over a, as I want to, and even banning people is unconscionable. But that's Section 230. That's what federal law, and you recognize that federal law is supreme in this case. You can, I, I, can, I, I can ban people for any and all reason. So how, if I can ban, ban it for any and all reason, how can you say that banning them is unconscionable since federal law is supreme in this case. So Mr. Caron says, now that I see that's what the unconscionability is about, basically he couldn't understand what the judge was talking about. I, let me just say that, of course, that is a, a right that Twitter would have had had it not said a word about it, about that it in its contractual document, a newspaper doesn't have to say that. But the First Amendment in Section 230 override this. His point is that Twitter has a right to ban people without it ever being in the terms of service. Its ability to ban is not dependent on whether or not it's in the terms of service or how much highlighting it provides or whether people see it. That's not the basis of their ability. They get the ability through the law, through Section 230 or the First Amendment. There's different cases. We've gone through that before. Some cases in history say that they're allowed to make discriminatory changes or decisions on their platform because that's their expression of speech and the government cannot change it, that's uh, freedom of speech. Other cases, which are probably more uh, up to date, are saying that it's really under Section 230, the Communication Decency Act, which provide them a cover. He says, we have that right. It doesn't have to be in the terms of service. And he's absolutely correct. The law gives them that right. There's been tons of cases. None of those cases made any, made any difference about, did not even look into the terms of service because it's not important at all. The law gave them the right to make discriminatory decisions on their platform. The reason why you put it into the, uh, into the terms of service is to provide proper notice. So there are things like, well, did I make changes properly over time? That's more contract law. It's not about whether or not Twitter can act on it. It's about, you know, did I provide you with proper notice? Did I fail to provide you with proper notice? And so it gets into this kind of an argument back and forth with the judge on it because, frankly, it doesn't make sense to him. Here. This is still the attorney for, the, uh, for Twitter. Section 230 gives, as the California Supreme Court said in Barrett, gives absolute immunity to any decision that can be boiled down to deciding whether or not to publish content. That is ultimately, that's absolutely true. The court says, you're misconstru misconstruing. The third claim has nothing to do with viewpoint discrimination. The third 
claim says it is unconscionable for Twitter to reserve to itself the right to revoke anybody's ability to be on the platform for any reason at all, including a little girl who said that she wanted to be on Twitter to be able to send a message to Santa Claus. Any. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be have anything to do with contract. It's any reason or no reason. And there you get the gist of the argument. The, 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 the judge says, this is not about Section 230. This is not about you banning for view because of the viewpoint or for content. This is about contract law and whether or not you're allowed to have the provision. But that's why I say that's a bad decision here. It's because that is, you know, the force from the tree kind of thing. When you say that you cannot ha that you cannot have a provision like that, the effect is that they cannot ban people, but we know that they can ban. So the law cannot say that this provision is unconscionable. You're not allowed to have a provision that says that you are allowed to ban people for any and all reason. That can never hold because federal law, which is supreme, and the California Supreme Court have held that as well. It says that you can ban them for any reason. So the Twitter attorney is absolutely correct. The contract has nothing to do with Twitter's rights under the law. It has to do with notice, notice, proper notice of changes over time. But that's something the court doesn't discuss at all about whether or not there was proper notice. You know, because you could argue that the way it's written did not provide proper notice. So people over time did not understand that Twitter changed. And it, it was look, it was changing over time. Beginning, it was going to be pretty much a, a free speech forum, but then it changed over time and I added, you could have had that argument that notification was improper or when did notification come into place, maybe, you know, but that's not what the court argues. It's arguing that it's unconscionable to have that provision and that's false. The judge just didn't really understand what the Twitter attorney said. He could not get it because, and the Twitter was correct. If federal law says I can do it, the contract makes no difference. Well, that provision has zero meaning because I'm permitted to do it under federal law. Let's go back to the uh, comments here. Random McRanderson, Twitter is not like the phone system in that Twitter is a public broadcast system, not a private conversation system. That's true. I I, I was wrong. I, I agree with that. It's not the exact thing, but he just said it's a communication system. So I was responding to that, but I I, just, I agree with what you're saying. Then Facebook is a private for, profile following other private for, profiles, etc. Correct. Uh, Ramsey Rammerman. The First Amendment protects publishers' right to select content because they are they are liable for that content. Two thirty gives Twitter immunity for what it publishes. Why does it get to be treated like a publisher? Because that's right. That goes back into the history of the law and why it passed. If you remember, I did a video um, that had on it the thumbnail of um, of Leo DiCaprio when in his uh, Wolf of Wall Street because the case came out of the Wolf of Wall Street. Basically, and most of you probably are going to be too young to remember this, before we had uh, Facebook and Twitter, we had Prodigy and CompuServe. And at that time, we're talking about pre-1996, the law was about whether or not you're a publisher. You no know, publishers get uh, your immunity, your ability to be sued, your liability is dependent on whether or not you make changes to other people's content. You're right. And that's what, and, and so they were comparing it to newspapers all the time. And that was true of the internet in the early days of the internet. And there were two cases that came out at the same time where CompuServe decided we are not making any sort of moderation to our forums. We didn't have a uh, platform. We had just, you know, uh, basic forums and they were not held liable. Prodigy wanted to be a, a family friendly forum. It actually controlled things and it was held liable. In that case, the reason why it's connected to the uh, Wolf of Wall Street is because the individual that was played by uh, Leonardo, Di Cap Leonardo DiCaprio Somebody on a forum anonymously said, basically, this this is a company of crooks. Uh, they're cheating people. You know, obviously it was true. We just didn't know it for a couple more years. 
the character played by Leonardo DiCaprio sued for sued and wanted the information about who actually put it in the process sued Twitter and Prodigy and Prodigy was held liable. The court saying, well, because you moderate your platform, you are not liable when somebody says a de de defaming statement on it. It wasn't defaming because it was actually true, but nonetheless. A senator on his way back to home, I believe, to California, hears this says, that makes no sense. We want platform to be able to moderate their uh, their their systems uh, better. And that's where Section 230 came through. So that kind of dichotomy on the publisher versus non-publisher doesn't work because we passed a law specifically to grant that kind of a blanket immunity. That's ultimately what it was. Before that, we had that. And, you know, and there's an argument of whether or not we should go back to that kind of a concept. Either you have a platform for free speech and you're not liable or you moderate it and you have to face liability because of decisions you make. Some people say that's a better system. I don't. I think that the Internet as we have it, however flawed and however often 230 can be misused, is in large part thanks to Section 230. The idea that these platforms can allow user content to be published without thinking about it too much. And they can make some decisions or not make some decisions, but not face liability. And that's been critical to the whole Web 2.0 development and now really to the more... Uh, Social, to social media internet that, that we have today. Things that just didn't have, and it would never have happened if they there was an exposure to liability. Um, all the Fox, sorry, the dashes were supposed to be emphasis. It was in reference to the concept of free speech being different than the protection from the government of the free speech. Right, but for you and me, the law, when it comes to First Amendment, has to deal with government. So when we speak about free speech outside of restrictions from the government, that's not what's ground. That's not grounded in law. That's our desire to that's our own social desire and value in it. You know, say what you know, if I build if we are you and I are talking and rather than deplatforming you because I want to stop you from saying it, I want to allow you to say, it. yes, I'm respecting free speech. It's not First Amendment free speech because I'm not the government, but it's nonetheless our application in a private sense. So I would like our platforms to have free speech arenas, right? I would like YouTube to have a free speech section and a non and a, and a moderated section so people can choose what, what to have. That does not mean that the government can come in and force it on them. I would like it, but that's not First Amendment free speech. You're But you're right. You're right what you're saying on that. Oh, again, sorry, I stopped the first one. Uh, on that note, how did the New York judge decide that the First Amendment protected non-U.S. citizens when it came to President Trump's attempt to temporarily, temporary immigration ban? I'm really wishing that the U.K. now had a written constitution for things like the First Amendment instead of unwritten one we have at the moment. Uh, the first one about the immigration, I don't know. I don't follow those kind of laws because, again, that de deals into politics. I'm trying to... My personal interests are in technology, are in games, are in on the online world. So that's the kind of stuff I follow. So it's just not something I follow. And I completely agree with you. And there are other countries where there are not constitutions the way you, uh, the United States has it. And it, that uniqueness, I mean, it does put the United States differently than anybody else. I can tell you that not only United United Kingdom, other uh, Western countries do not have the First Amendment, as we know it, enshrined in the Constitution in a way that's inviolable, that, that cannot be uh, cannot be treaded upon by laws, at least not unless there's m massive support for it. Unlucky Eddie, how dare you not support my political affiliation? I support it since I don't know what it is. I absolutely support everybody's political affiliation. So what is it? If I don't care, do I not support yours or do I support them all? I don't know. It's a good question. <laughs> Mara Kitsumi, the potato peeler I sent to your email since I am banned from Twitter. <laughs> okay, I'll check it out. Bob Bobby, if they have, if they do have a basis and actively suppress views they don't agree with, given they now house a public forum, would it not have any extra burden of fairness to over representation? Um, yeah, but somebody else uh, put a similar kind of idea above. That's the... that. 
what you're saying is a logical extension once you accept the ruling. The problem is, it's I believe it's completely false. That there's no logic in what the judge said and how he framed it. And I think it's going to be reverse on appeal. I don't see how that can stand, how a government through a single tweet can actually force a private form to turn into a virtual public form. I don't understand that concept. I've never seen it. For that to happen, there has to be a lot of process and procedure in place for government to take over private property. So I don't see that as a logic that's standing. There might be some other logic that I don't know of. That logic doesn't, uh, I, I just don't buy. So while your logic might be a good extension, I just think that the whole thing falls apart once you actually read the judge's, the judge's opinion. So I think it'll be a reverse. So I don't think that would be an extension. I don't think that the forums have to be, that the platform, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, I don't think they have to be too concerned about it. Uh, Adrian Sanada, this is a rather off topic, but what is your accent? I can't quite place it and I'm terribly curious. Yeah, uh, I've never actually said it. Nobody really ever. It's surprising most people say that I'm uh, Russian. Um, I'm originally from Israel. That's my accent, but it's it's not an, it's not an accent that's distinguishable because I came here when I was 13 and I didn't like my accent. Everybody was making fun of me, so I was watching TV in Florida and I was trying to mimic. And I was I'm in Florida. It's a lot of Hispanic and. Florida is really a, I would consider a non-accent kind of place. So what I have is kind of a mix of those two together. You would find that my accent is very, very unique. Very few, few people can actually place it. Dev Youngson, if you buy a hard copy of a game that requires internet and connection to their servers at all time, if they stop access to you, can you demand a refund as the product no longer works? That's a great point. I mean, they will tell you no because it's it's in their EULA that um, they can ban you. And the idea is that if they provided you sufficient notice, even if you paid for it, if there was sufficient notice and it was done properly through the right parties, that they can still do it. It becomes a problem because often what you have, what we've seen is things like Steam, which is often a third party, platform where games are played where you are paying money to effectively to the developer and yet you're getting banned by the platform by steam that becomes an issue but i can see a successful argument by these software companies saying that you still signed the license you still paid 60 80 dollars for it but that was just an expensive license that's only as good as until the moment we ban you and it may not seem fair but uh right now that's a state of the law this guy in California doesn't think so, thinks that these contracts are of adhesion, are questionable, but he goes against the law of just about every state. The whole concept is completely ridiculous. Let's go back to it. Mr. Chrome again, Karam, which is again the, uh, the attorney for Twitter, and he says, in a bookstore, a newspaper editor, or a cable platform has a First Amendment right to make good, bad, horrible decisions about who and who does not get sorry, who and who does not get to speak on its platform and what content does and does not get to be on its platform. This is what the First Amendment is about. And newspaper editors are not called into court to explain why they didn't accept that little girl's note to Santa Claus as a letter to the editor. They have the right. That's and that's, that's absolutely true. It's it, The concept is ridiculous, and it's only because this judge did not really take the, his, his decision one logical extension, saying that if you are telling Twitter that they cannot have a provision in their contract, that they can make judgment about, uh, about who is who's or is not on their platform, that means that you are essentially negating Section 230, which gives them an absolute immunity to make any decisions about uh, who posts on their platform. So it makes no sense and it's just out, outright wrong. So let me find you the this section which I think here. Here. The court, and this is the court. This is where, again, this, this is just a, a great argument. I wish I was there. I wish there was a recording to listen to because I think this would have made for a great argument. The court says, 
does Twitter have the right to take somebody off its platform if it does so because it doesn't like the fact that the person is a woman or gay or would be in violation of Title VII or would be in violation of the age discrimination laws or the disability discrimination law? Of course not. And this just shows how the, the judge doesn't know the law. It's the judge is arguing something. He doesn't ask. He's making a decision. He's making a conclusion. Of course not. They cannot violate uh, discrimination law. Twitter cannot make a decision based on uh, says I'm an, I'm not allowing somebody to be on my platform because he's gay or uh, because uh, she's a woman, and that's wrong. They can. They may choose or to do so or not. But when you have a blanket immunity, and that's what Section Two Thirty is. I guess making any decision, regardless of the content, then yes, you can ban somebody because they're a woman. That's just the way the uh, the law actually works here. And this is Twitter's uh, attorney says the First Amendment would give Twitter the right, just like it would give a newspaper the right to choose not to run an opt-in from some because she happens to be a woman. Absolutely correct. I mean, bottom line is the judge was completely wrong about the law. He makes he doesn't understand it. It might be something that people would find abhorrent, despicable, completely against, and that's okay. But doesn't mean that their that the platforms are liable for it. And that's the key. Section two thirty provides a kind of blanket uh, uh, immunity here. And this just goes back and forth, and uh, the court says again, again mistaken. The allegation is is as to the relationship with the license. Oh, I'm not showing it to you. That's genius. Again, the allegation is that the relationship with the licensee that can be terminated pursuant to terms of service for any reason or no reason. That's an allegation. So, is your position is absolutist? that Twitter has an absolute First Amendment right to remove anybody from its platform, even if doing so would be discriminatory on the basis of religion and gender? Mr. Chrome, yes, your honor. Flat out correct. The judge doesn't see it. That's the problem here. That's why this, this not only is it wrong, but you have to understand, this is a low-level state court. It's completely meaningless here. So it's it's meaningful to this case but it's not really meaningful much beyond that and here mr karam i don't think that the very highly general statement that are discussing the complaint like things like twitter is a twitter executive saying twitter is the free speech wing of the free speech party that is not a factual statement at all and it's not a promise that will never take down your account the statement, you know, they point to a statement made in the Twitter rule some six or seven years ago, which is no longer there. It hasn't been there for years. The Twitter would not censor user content except in specified circumstance. What is he talking here? So the judge ignores the, what the attorney said about Section 230 here. And they're moving now to another area. It says, you know what? Over time, in different circumstances, Twitter said it's a platform for free speech. They cannot change it now because you brought people on free speech, kind of like uh, we spoke about with some of, the, of you guys about notification. They brought people on free speech. You, right? So this is basically false advertisement. Again, it's, this is an attempt to, to get into, you know, either the provision is unconscionable or it was some, it was some sort of violation in the contract here between the parties here. And... Again, this makes no legal sense because it's a failure of the judge to take to understand there's another step here. Once you tell Twitter that, let me go, let me point it out again here. Once you, uh, here it is here, that once you tell them that they are, that they have to abide by statements made six or seven years ago. That means that Twitter cannot change its uh, its contract. It's not a question of whether or not sufficient notice was given. 
the judge is pointing to things said six, seven years ago that by now has been changed in the terms of service. And it says, well, what you're doing now is in violation of what you said six, seven years ago. But under contract law, I'm allowed to change everything. And when I'm making changes that allows me to ban people, once again, that's Section 230. You cannot tell me that I cannot make changes that bans people based on the content of, content of what they're saying. Because Section 230 says I can ban them for any reason. Once again, it's not false advertisement. It's not a breach of contract. It's not an unconscionable provision because I don't have to rely on the contract. The law gives me that right. I'm providing it for notice purposes and we can argue about whether or not I give sufficient notice. But it's not about the rights because I have that right under the First Amendment and Section 230. So there's a whole circle. It's another argument, but it gets back to the same thing as the judge said before. John, sorry if that has already been asked, but if the politician Twitter is considered a public forum, does that mean it is illegal for Twitter to ban accounts? Yeah, we already discussed it twice. Not a problem. The idea ultimately here that while this is a logical extension of what you are saying, what the, the judge said, I believe that the entire argument by the judge was false and it should be, it would be, I think, reversed on appeal. So yes, but it's... Uh, the, the argument itself is legally uh, lacking, and that's why you can listen to some of the prior comments on it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, Ramsey Ram Ram Rammerman. But isn't that immunity a valuable right granted by the government? When government grants a right, it can come with First Amendment responsibility. Maybe First Amendment due process protection, notice appeal. But, the, but when the government grants... Oh, you're saying that, yes, if they put it into the law, right? Section 230 did not say, look, we're going to grant you immunity as long as you're free speech. If you remember, that's what um, Senator Cruz, Ted Cruz said when the Senate was grilling the first YouTube um, and Google uh, Facebook and Twitter, and later on was grilling just Mark Zuckerberg after the whole debacle with Cambridge Analytica. And he was asking each time, are you a public forum? Because he, then he was making a statement that Section 230 was predicated on you being basically a public forum. And if you, you're not a public forum, you don't get the immunity. That's the kind of idea. is, And that's not what the law is. You can argue that's the way the law should be. I... I probably would disagree because I think that we we should have problem with the way platform utilize the law and potentially discriminate against us, not with the law that provides Im immunity so that the internet can grow. The whole user based user um, user based content is actually have grown the internet. I think that we've needed that, so. If you want to place restrictions or let's say you have to grant free, you have to be a free speech platform, that means that your immunity is limited. And if you moderate, if you actually uh, try to control speech, you would lose that uh, immunity. But that's pretty much what we had prior to 1996. Right. So and some people have said that's the right thing. You know, I've had actually that argument with Tim Pool about whether or not I'm I, I like Section 230, even though I think it's misused all the time. And he would think maybe it would be better to go back to the older system where, you know, either have a, have a free speech platform or don't. And that's a valid argument. That's something you have to present to your congressman. Basically, you would, they would have to repeal Section 230. At that point, it will go back to the old process and pretty much has the same effect. Dile. Dile. I understand that it is understood Twitter has the right to ban people indiscriminately, but if Twitter cited hate speech for the ban, changes anything rather than saying nothing. It, it doesn't change, you know, because if I'm allowed to ban you, then I can ban you for hate speech, even if hate, it wasn't hate speech, right? If I can ban you for any reason, I can ban you for false reasons, too. And the concept of whether or not they say something or not, that that cannot be the basis for the immunity. So, again, 
we may not like the way they utilize Section 230 to discriminate, right? We may think it's, it's either it shouldn't discriminate or with very few exceptions like incitement and violence, maybe it shouldn't, uh, in protection of children, maybe beyond that they shouldn't do it. Nonetheless, the law is, is really devoid of any sort of uh, um, limitation. Now there's some limitation through the whole FOSTA um, adoption. We haven't really seen how that's going to work, but beyond that, those uh, adoption, there is no real limitation. Random McRadnison, I think Twitter and all these social media companies should be declared the new public square and the only thing they should be able to ban is illegal speech. For To do, to do that, you have to pass a law. You're not going to get that through the court system. So you'd have to pass new laws that say that these are, they are the new public square. They're effectively uh, a public square in a way that, uh, you know, if you opened up a private park, but invite people to come in and, and speak their mind, be the same kind of things, or if you officially dedicated yourself to it. But right now the law is not there. So if I think many people would agree with you. But to do that, you've got to change the law. You can't ask the court to do it because that's not what the law is. Then, oh, you continue. Sorry. Otherwise, they become propaganda outlets and are bad for society. Your accent is obviously Israeli. So if you're familiar with that accent, having Lior as a first name seals the deal. Yeah, of course, my name is just a dead giveaway if you heard any uh, Israeli names. It's a very common name. Uh... Rami Ramerson on Trump Twitter. If an elected official rents a private hall for a public meeting, the private hall becomes a public forum for a while under the official's control. You are, if, if right, if what you're under that scenario, I believe you are correct that when, but they can still ban certain people, right? You can still have a private event. It doesn't have to be a public event. All the time it's thrown, you know, a party for the press, a party for specific people, for donors. So it doesn't mean that just because it's creating a limited public forum that anybody can have access to it. So the government all the time bans people from it. Not every public government building is a public forum. No, the FBI doesn't allow you to uh, do whatever you want. They may at some point, you know, I'm going to dedicate today temporarily these this hall for a lecture and invites the public to come in but doesn't mean everything is and doesn't mean that they you know five minutes after the that lecture is off they can shut it down mother fox thanks again for the responses we agree free speech is a social construct and the first amendment is only relevant to the government how can privately owned public forum be held accountable by changing the law by telling by the by you could remove the section 230 you could limit it i mean but literally you would have to change the law it's only going to be done through congress the courts cannot do it um there's so much precedent i mean they could they could come back and say look i mean they, they really could but it would be a monumental change now we have seen those kind of monumental changes before you know our rights of free speech did not exist always. We It was basically, a, as we know it, it came out of the 1960s based on a dissent that was uh, of Justice Holmes and Justice Brandes back in the 30s. Until the 60s, people could be arrested for certain seditious statements, certain statements against the government, certain statements against the war, against the draft. People could be arrested and jailed for it. It we evolved through that because of what of what started as a small dissent by a couple of incredible judges that took a long time for to turn the entire court around. So I'm, what I'm saying, it's not currently the way everything is. There is no possibility. There would have to be some powerful judges that right now probably will be in the dissent that can convince judges over time that when they're looking at these platforms, there's something different. These are not what uh, these are not private platform. They're not like anything we've seen before. They're not even like malls or uh, streets. They're very, very different. They're they're a dominant form of communication where people interact and effectively through the power they create through their very success, they created something different. That's what you have. So you could do that. 
we just have to find the judges of that magnitude. We really haven't seen those kind of uh, judges. Uh, again, we've seen amazing judges on different platforms, but that kind of judges that can really change an entire court through a small descent, we really haven't seen lately. So right now, I think your best chance, if you want to change it, is to talk to Congress. Uh, Adrian Sanada, uh, and thank you for the answer. I was originally thinking it was possible for an Austrian accent, but you're very correct that it's qu that it's certainly quite unique. Meg D, could the other party make the argument that a newspaper does not allow public to post article? They did many, many times over and over and over again, but the judge doesn't accept it. The they newspapers accept articles, but then make decisions over what to post. That's what Twitter was trying to say. It's yeah, right. Not a free for all like uh, Twitter, but he was trying to say whether or not Twitter allows everybody and then ban them versus a newspaper that that takes in, but then don't only then allows certain ones to be posted. That should be the same. The judge disagreed with that analogy. Uh, Dave Gonzalez, based on the judge's verdicts to not allow Twitter to remove a user, does that flow down to user not being able to block somebody or also face a lawsuit? No. And that is not what the case actually said. This is a demur. It's a motion to dismiss by Twitter. Effectively, the case just moves forward. It's It, there's, it doesn't say anything. It's quite possible, I would hope, that Twitter can win on summary judgment in this case because I think it's a slam dunk. It's just this is an aberration. This uh, decision, it's a bad decision by the judge. So I, I would hope that he would basically throw it all out and rule in favor of Twitter on the on the summary judgment. But uh, it's only it's a very narrow decision that says, and it's a bad decision that says that that provision is unconscionable and because the whole idea that they can make changes at any time without even for no reason at all as a result effectively he can throw that out which doesn't give him the right to do it as a result the complaint is sufficient to move forward he didn't rule on the merits of anything remember he threw out the whole public forum the whole free speech argument that's out so only with respect to uh, the contract, whether or not there was unfair competition, whether or not there was a breach of the contract between the user and Twitter, did he say that because that provision is unconscionable, they can move on, they can continue in their lawsuit. But there were, otherwise, there was no real determination. So I'm saying it's a low level. It's all he did was not allow for the mirror kind of a uh, motion to dismiss in a very narrow area that is not likely to benefit anyone. If this was controlling, then uh, Zombie Go Boom should have won their lawsuit for the apocalypse. Prager U should have won their lawsuit. You would have basically every lawsuit in California alone, forget about any other state, should have been when it came to you know, the platforms making their own unique decision, essentially discriminating, making decisions about what to allow, what not to allow. All of them were wrong and it will be reversed. This is just a bad decision. It doesn't actually follow the uh, the precedent set by, you know, years and years of, uh, of decisions in California. Random McRanderson, how can they discriminate against somebody on the basis of their gender? Doesn't that sound like the law should supersede basic human rights. The, but that's the whole point. That's what Section 230 is. You are... It, it sounds ridiculous, but that's what was passed, and the courts have upheld it. And that's why, look, it's theoretical, because Twitter will never tell you we are going to discriminate based on the fact that, they're, that she's a woman. Obviously, they're never going to tell you. That's why a lot of times they don't tell you anything. It's legally, their, their attorneys tell them, you know what? Don't say anything. Just ban them. You're allowed to ban them without giving too much information. When you give information, that opens up a cans of worm. That opens you up to potential litigation. I can tell you sometimes I've given that. When things are 
when you know that you know why you're banning, but sometimes it's a little uh, tricky. Sometimes the decision by the attorneys is because I've given it before, ban because you permitted without giving the information, because that can open you up to liability or just to a lawsuit. Even though you win, you'll open you up to a lawsuit. So while well, you'll never know that unless you know somebody inside Twitter decides, oh no, 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 we sat around the room, we said we don't, well, we don't want to allow women on the platform. That's what Section 230 is. It's complete and utter immunity. You would think that somehow this would be unconstitutional, but it's not because it's private property. Because you're allowed to kick somebody out of your house because she's a woman. You are, uh, you are allowed to discriminate in, 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 in your, uh, in your, on your own property. Inside many businesses, there are exceptions to public accommodation and such like that. It becomes a little more tricky. Yeah, there's not a complete this, but ultimately on private property, you don't have to adhere to the standard set by the government. And that's what it comes down to. Uh, however abhorrent you find it, however despicable you think it is, that's the law. And if you don't like it, you got to change it. Um, Mario Kitsumi, if the premise that being blocked from Twitter is illegal in the U.S., how... Would that work in the UK law process-wise? Well, I mean, the, uh, Twitter has to abide by the laws of the country to the extent to which, let's say, tomorrow it becomes illegal for Twitter to ban minorities in the UK, then Twitter will not be able to do it. It will not be able to rely on US law when it comes to the UK or any other country. That's part of what's happening right now, is that there was some similarities between laws within a certain measure but you now you see a lot of division, different countries, different laws, and all these platforms are learning that they have to change the way they present and provide their services in those countries. So, Ivrish Nanabarth, have you ever thought of a career as a judge? You seem to have some knowledge of the law. I thought about it. I find this part really, really interesting. And I actually was thinking that I was thinking about this for a very long time and I actually meant to discuss it in the beginning so let me just discuss it now among the four people that are probably left on the stream that my thoughts were let me give you a big bad, bad example of like a judge Judy for the internet world that there are so many people that are of, of a conflict and sometimes the resorting is just to screaming online to false flagging sometime unfortunately to uh, bad lawsuits we've seen so many lawsuits that should never have gone forward I was thinking that maybe as part of this channel we can provide kind of like the ju judge judy for the internet people that have a, an online conflict you know usage of people pe pe people's uh, content without permission you know whether or not you're defaming or not they can present their case to me i can mediate it online either through a stream or a recorded video something like that i would like to pursue that if you guys run across something if you can suggest it to some people if people are in conflict, if they want to bring it up, we can do it both completely as, as a standard mediation where there's no obligation to follow up on it, or we can do it the way you would see it on TV, which is kind of like um, you sign an agreement that the people's court kind of stuff where you allow for the judge, whatever the mediator decides at the end of the day actually would rule. Either way, it might be a, a good service, be interesting. That was, uh, that's kind of like my thoughts of, I'm not interested necessarily in being a judge because I'm not interested in that kind of a constraint. I like I like this interaction, which I would never be able to do if I'm a judge. But uh, I think that there might be a potential to do something like that online. So if you come across conflict, which I'm sure you'll do on a daily basis, if you guys can spread the words, people con uh, contact me as long as I get two, two parties that are willing to have that discussion. We can do presenting of cases and try to make some decision. I would love it. I think that that would be very interesting as well. Dave Gonzalez, thank you for answering my question. Enjoy your video and your experience, knowledge, and opinion. Thank you so much. Tiva Les, 70, oh, 75 is still there. My God. After nearly two hours, which you're going to have to stop. Judge Judy pays both sides appearance fees. I see what you're trying here. You're a sneaky boy. Judge pays both sides appearance fees. Oh, I'm not trying to try. That would not be a fee. Uh, I didn't try that at all. I didn't even know that. I literally thought it was big content. Uh, so be absolutely no fee involved here. It's pure content for the channel. Obviously, I get the value of the content. I, I like it. Maybe we can resolve some problems before they escalate either 
to false flagging, false DMCAs, complaining to the platform and trying to get people deplatformed. Maybe we can finish this before people file lawsuits. It's going to cost people money and not going to go anywhere. That's my thought. Not fees. Elliot Van Y. So that's why a very innovative and creative service that is much needed. Very cool. Thank you. Mother Fox. So like petitions, I'm guessing it be a little more involved. So you get an idea from the audience and then make a case before the Supreme Court or something akin to that. No, I mean, the idea would be that two parties tell me their tell me their sides and I make a decision based on based on the law and the, and, and the platform's own rules about how it would fall, you know defamation stuff like that yeah i would not be appealing it to anything basically based on they would kind of trust me as the mediator for their decision that's the idea behind it and you get to be the audience listening to all the sides in the decision and voice your opinion about whether or not i'm i'm completely wrong about anything um mario kitsumi thank you for doing this i find it all fascinating as a disabled vet thank you so much for your service i'm sorry for your disability with no skills outside military, I keep thinking of doing something that is not physical and law seems to be my liking. You should pursue it then. Just try to do some, uh, try to get maybe a, a job with a, a law firm. There's always, uh, they always need help on some projects. See if you like the actual work, the actual legal work. You know, uh, a lot of times the practice of law is different than the discussion of law. Or you can study law and be a professor if you like the whole idea of of discussions and uh, analysis but i think it's a great idea just you know try to get a an internship or a job with a, a law firm to see what they actually do day to day it's, sometimes people find it very boring so it's not as exciting as you think dave youngson doesn't the law on between state trading trading prohibit refusing service for discriminating in, as you pointed out in like hotels yes the public accommodation thing so far, that has not been stretched out to uh, online services. You know, there is the whole issue whether or not, you know, the whole uh, it's outside the realm of this discussion about a store. Obviously, the whole Baker uh, test, whether or not you can the Baker can forbid, can uh, discriminate against you. Or is this a public accommodation issue? You know, it's it depends. I mean, the law does uh, does take it for granted that you're in a private uh this is your private property and you're allowed to discriminate. So unless other than very specific areas, they're not going to stretch uh, public accommodations. So right now it has not been. It might be an, ar an argument, but it's not been a successful argument so far that this should be uh, stretched to uh, online platform. George Wyckoff, I'm being called back to discussion back when 230 was put in about how it allowed discrimination and people saying no, clearly it could never be construed that way. I called them fools. Yeah. I mean, we... I'm I'm going to assume, and I don't know, I'm, uh, I don't know, uh, obviously, UK politics. I'm going to assume that the people, that the good legislators in the United Kingdom and in Scotland decided, you know what? We have a lot of minorities, a lot of religious minorities, a lot of uh, minorities based on nationalities, and they being harassed. They're being insulted by people insulting their religion their background their nationality their language stuff like that we should have some minimal law in place you know nothing huge threaten people maybe with you know six months jail a small fine allow the court to just dismiss it and give probation but just as a way to protect their interest and you can see how quickly that can can lead to completely absurd decisions where somebody's actually threatened with the with the jail time and uh, fine, it's not. Sometimes people think that people think that a law is narrow, but you have to understand that once the law is in place, it's going to be construed as broad as possible, and that's exactly what happened here. The government wanted the government wanted platforms to be able to moderate. They saw Prodigy and its moderation of family friendly. It wanted more of that. No, it didn't think about about uh, discrimination based on viewpoint and uh, and uh, things like that. Didn't say that, you know what, you think about whether or not PragerU is going to be considered too much of an extremist and not being provided access to all the audience and just, or just to a small audience. That's not what he thought back in 1996. 
but that's just the reality of it. That's why laws have to be so narrowly construed so that it's not going to be as widely uh, read as uh, in the future when, when you know, technology and advancement go far beyond what was originally conceived of. But yeah, you're right. Mother Fox, got it. Yeah, I like that courts are now live streaming trial publicly. It's always interesting to see three plus judges ruling together, especially when they disagree. I agree. Dove Youngston, also great steam as ever and lots of interesting answer. Mario Kitsumi, like a paralegal. I'm not sure what the re last reference is to. I think we need to finish here because we are over two hours here, even though the first, maybe it's just two hours because I wasted so much of the beginning on just bad uh, setup. My fault, tried to upgrade the audio. I'm going to send this new equipment back. I think this will work the way it is right now. Save me a couple hundred dollars anyway. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it for coming. If you have any questions, any concerns, anything you want to discuss, please leave it down below. Just remember, this particular case is very, very narrowly construed. It's only about the contract. It, it makes this the idea that a specific statement is unconscionable and allows it to move forward. It makes no real statement. It actually rejected everything about free speech, about public forum, and made no real decision. It's a low-level decision that is not only false but completely meaningless. We'll have to see where it goes uh, next, later on. In But I suspect that if this judge can redeem himself, will be in the summary judgment phase where hopefully this will go away because it's just completely incongruent with, with the rest of California. Thank you very much. If you have any questions and concern, leave them down below. Love to talk to you. Bye.